and it's just that one person is not going to take any other person for Dr. Mamuta so that you can give ten other reasons as well. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, can I lend your ears just for a minute while uh, Dr. Mbengeki is being uh, called in? Um, my name is uh, Professor Mbengeki, I'm the former Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs. Uh, I just wanted to welcome uh, delegates and colleagues from uh, industry and uh, various uh, stakeholders who are attending this uh, symposium. The Vice Chancellor was supposed to be here, but uh, he was called for an agent meeting of the Ministry of Higher Education. Unfortunately, there is another conference running in the Department of Education, and I was uh, standing in there for the executive. So I just thought I should just welcome you know, all our partners and delegates. And uh, I met Dr. Mangunjo on his way here, but I missed, you know, everything that he presented. But uh, all the same, you know, thank you very much. And uh, I wish you all very fruitful and insightful deliberation. Thank you. Question that was that was asked by Jonah Mengel before leaving for breakfast was uh, why are we able to produce uh, the local currency? Uh, the, what is the procedure of paying uh, That one has come very well initially. That uh, we are able to of missing confidence. When you are missing confidence, you don't want to enter the new variable that choice control. Secondly, as I said earlier, we can only use lower currency after the fundamentals have been achieved. And the first one, the fundamental factor that I see in this column is about confidence itself. Confidence itself is also a fundamental factor. And the confidence both from, from the consumers and also from business. So it's better to have a problem which you are having the current problem than to have a current than to have a change of current problem. So the devil that we know is a better devil. That you go to the bank, go in the queue, look for money. That you go to the bank and get money which you don't use. Oh, which is useless. So 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 we today to the bank so we are very clear in this government policy. That the money that we are going to continue under dollarization, under the mount carrying system, up to the time when we believe that the fundamentals have been achieved. And the fundamentals, we said many times in my other statement, that our reserves need to go up. We have no access to foreign currency, and therefore we could bring that. The gap which is there is going to be used for the foreign currency gap. We also know that uh, not all the local dollars are used for export or for importation. They also use it for local, for local purchases. So I think let's maintain that uh, situation. That's why we're also against this idea of a land rise in the economy. Because again, we are bringing the variable that no one even knows what it means. Uh, people always like the statistics. What goes to South Africa is not about 30% of our exports. What goes to South Africa is about 25 to 30%. The other thing that they talk about is the transshipment. All the gold in Zimbabwe is exported through South Africa. So it's platinum is exported through South Africa, but it's paid in foreign currency. So when you see those figures, you are adding shipment, not export to Africa. So at the end of the day, it gives a different combination of 
And uh, Professor Deloja, Professor Ashwin is here. I was, are you, are you talking to him? I'm going to The right is also eternalizable, can be eternalized, but it's also for the guys. Yeah. Does it come beyond truth? <laughs> How do you get right in Zimbabwe? You, 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 you sell your goods first to US dollars. Then you, then you sell US dollars to South Africa and get How's that matter? Yeah. You export the foreign currency and you export and then export the currency to South Africa and send it to South Africa. For them to give you what? The lands. They don't just put it in the because you are now using what? You are now using the land as uh, a currency. After all, you pay the bank currency, you pay the basket, you know. And that is a place of a choice. People in Zimbabwe, they made a choice. They decided that they want to use more of the US dollar than not other currencies. And you can't run out from that. Same thing. So if you force them, again, you are, you are, you are getting like you are clear, you are not destroying that conflict again. So we are going to do the So, or sometimes you are going to say, what you say is it's very fundamental. But if for now, we are saying this is a devil, that is, we know it's a devil than the one that you are creating. What if we just say, what you are using a lot of dollars, which are RTGS, which are also treasure bills, that was the law currency. I think that is a different game with people. Because people want their dollars. What I've noticed is that people want their dollars. This is why they are also keeping the bonus. It's because it's one one. It's a store of value. It's a store of value concept. That, that is what it is not with. So you need to deal with the store of value that needs to produce. So for now, the government position that we are going to remain under the money currency system, dollarization. In saying so, I want to thank you very much for uh, listening to, to me. Uh, the Central Bank uh, efforts are there, trying to help the economy. Uh, and those who are in business, universities, let's not create ivory towers. Let's create a functional people. Who when they leave this university, they go and do business. All businesses in the world decide being small, but think big. We want more entrepreneurs. We don't do business. Those MBA students, they should start their businesses. You see, as a Zimbabwe, they spend more 30 years, 40, 50 years working. But he cannot go and take a loan for four years to start his own business. He's afraid. Fear factor. I think because we, our education is more tailored to employment. So when I was growing up myself, I'm talking about why do we ask why do we grow up to be a teacher, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a private body for this? And I said, I want to work to do my day. Get the difference. If you ask some of the people, you come out and say, I'm not to work and I'm a They tell you what they want to do, they want to do what it is. So it's not good. If you do it, you should also say to them, when I continue working, what do I want to do? I want to build the house. And this is that, that's, that's, what, that's what your passion. Everyone has a passion here, right? So use your passion to make money, to make it good for the community. This idea of just working for others, that's why we are today. Those people, other people give you arms, hide in the No one will know how to do Oh, this one's my food is mine. Chabuda has another So I want to challenge you. What is the university students, the university leaders, they help us to develop the students that are there. That also make uh, Zimbabwe become good again, to make it rise and shine, to make it, you know, let's this country, it's all our country. Those are the passion of mind, we have got money for mind, we have money for women, money for, uh, for, for uh, youth. I said, this, oh, why are we there where we are? But then, some people prefer to go and queue in the bank. Some of it's productive, they don't make it. Those people want to queue, others, that's their job. Yeah. You know what they do? Let me be free. Some people want to marry. They need some account. They need some account. Mom, they say. The way I just get that address today. If you say that address is ten people, one thousand dollars, they go and sell it. So they also be protected in the queue. So what? But they protect. Those are the people in the queue now. Now the others, the others are serious. Others are not serious. Because that you cannot tell who is serious, who is who is business, and who is job. Those are the side that are getting it. But I'm not saying everyone. The others who are inconvenienced, who are very serious. But those ones who are serious, I'm saying, use also plastic money. Why do you want to catch yourself in the pocket? It's okay, I'm earning my plastic money. Go to my plastic money. And I also run my, my, my small grocery shops. I was saying my plastic, you're going to the same machine. I don't charge the people there, I think it's cheaper. 
But is someone still in the queue? No, they want the mindset, the mindset change. Want to change that mindset. So those who are who are good at writing, I one day I was a dream of people like uh, this uh, uh, Richard Francis business. And we want reporters who when they report business, they report business. Yeah. Don't miss it. Don't miss this, this, this business. If you're in business, big business. I mean that uh, it's gonna be the uh, business, 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 uh, business week. Oh. If it's oh, business, yeah. business week. It's not good. Business should be business weekly. Don't miss it. If you miss it again, you'll be more about that. And also B is we don't make ourselves. Those are things that that should also be discussed. That's people discussion. That's what it is. So I want to thank you very much that we've come and understand it. And that uh, uh, with these uh, words that we discuss here, it will help uh, to uh, uh, motivate people to continue talking about it. And then they come to up with solutions. And then our office are there to your questions. You can also raise that to you. You can by emails. We are there to respond to your questions. We don't fear any person because the country is ours. And we remain in Zimbabwe. And that's where our board is prepared uh, are going to be in Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mangunga. Had I been at the at National Post Stadium or Farm, I would have said, I guess it's the wrong platform. Thank you so much for that passionate presentation. We now move on to the next session, and uh, we put up on the director of ceremony streaming. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Makoshongwe. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mangunga for responding to the questions. Now, in the interest of time, we are going to have 15 minutes of presentation, and uh, our next presenter is Dr. Kadenge. Um, he's going to have 15 minutes, and then I will ask Mr. Zembe, who is here, I think, to quickly respond to the presentation before we open the floor. Uh, Dr. Kadenge, please, you have your 15 minutes. Let it be to the uh, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Master of Ceremonies. Uh, all protocols observed. concepts that he used. Uh, basically, my focus is to really uh, talk about what one could consider as the optimal currency arrangement for Zimbabwe. Uh, what I'm going to do is just to quickly go over the menu of possible currency arrangements. That there is the currency arrangement which we call full dollarization, there's what is called randomization. Then there's also the option, Radman Union without the Zim dollar, Radman Union with the, Zim, the Zimbabwe dollar, Rand versus the dollar, Mount Currents regime, and then the reintroduction of the Zimbabwe dollar. Of course, I'll have to change a few things in light of the governor's presentation. Uh, so I suppose I'll just be going over this quite quickly, just responding to some to his intervention. I, I, we are all familiar with the long queues and some of us, I missed being in the queue today because that's what I normally do. <laughs> 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 but the point I want to make really is that uh, what we have here is not a cash crisis. It's not a cash crisis. As the, as the governor said, the crisis here is a, it's a crisis of production, not, 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 not cash. Uh, hence, as he was also saying about the cash ban, that people are now buying and selling cash. Uh, really, Zimbabweans don't, in my view, worry about whether the currency is local or foreign. It really doesn't matter whether it's local or foreign. What is important is whether it is fulfilling its functions, the functions of money. 
I hear people talking about dollarization in Zimbabwe and some allegations made about who dollarized. I think it is the public that dollarized. That's true. People voted with their feet. They moved away from the Zimbabwe dollar. So at times I get surprised when people uh, really are asking for the return of the, I will explain the return of the Zim dollar. Because Zimbabwe has demonstrated that at least at the time, it was no longer a currency. And I will explain why. Uh, for, a, for, for, for money, for something to be money used as money, it should, be, it should be able to be a store of value. When you sell your cow today for $300, you should be able next month to buy another cow for $300. But as you recall, around 2008, when you sold your cow for $300, the following day you would be lucky to buy a boat with the proceeds from that. <laughs> then the, the third day, a chicken would be lucky. That's why it did not make sense to hold on to the money, because it would, be, it would lose its value in your hands. So if the Zim dollar were to be brought back today, I can bet that not many people would be keen to hold on to it for the store of value uh, function. Medium of exchange. The, what we use as currency has to be readily accepted in exchange for goods and services. But so, some of you, you also realize around 2008, 2009, if you were renting some property or you were a tenant and you wanted to pay the rental in Zim dollars, they would rather you pay the rental in groceries or hard currency. Hard currency. Unit of account. The unit of account function of money. Money is what we use to measure the value of goods and services. So, so when I say the value of a cow is $300, you are using money as a unit of account. But what was happening around 2008, 2009, was that as you were using the ruler to measure the height of someone, the ruler itself was also changing. It was elastic. <laughs> so it was not really, it was no longer a suitable uh, unit of account. That's why people really, if you want to scare some people, talk about the Zim dollar. But it's a return. Quite a number. Whether they are just fine or not, it's something else. Uh, the current challenge really is about the availability of currency. But as I was saying, really the issue is not about currency. The crisis we have here is not a currency crisis. It's a production crisis. Let me illustrate this. Money does not make us richer by having more money, especially when it's domestic money. Because what money does is to entitle you to part of goods and services. So if you increase your entitlement to something that is falling, production is falling, you are increasing your entitlement to it, what only happens is that price is rise. You end up with inflation. So, a what is happening, but I, I may disagree just slightly with the, with, 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 the, with, the, with the government, in the sense that the queues that I see, apart from people accessing funds so that they can sell the money, the other issue is the lack of confidence. That if you are not assured of accessing your funds when you want them, when you want to access them, then you go to the bank. Yeah. Because what happens, what happens under normal circumstances is, the system we have, the banking system we have, is what is called fractional banking. So when someone deposits $100 in a bank, ordinarily, you don't expect them to withdraw the money on a daily basis. We can assume, let's say, of the $100 on a daily basis, let's assume that they would want 10% of it as cash. So what happens is, when you deposit $100 in a bank, the bank only needs to keep $10 as cash for you. Then it lends the other $90. Of the $90, it only needs to keep $9 and it lends $81. But from the $81, it keeps $8.10. So in fact, under normal circumstances, for every $1,000 in bank balances, banks only need to keep $100. But with lack of confidence for the $1,000, you need the $1,000. That's why people are in those queues. Is really a reflection of lack of money. Yeah. Otherwise, money should really be in wallets. Because, sorry, let's say at the bank, and what you need to spend, either in your wallet or whatever wallet, because now 
you, you have plastic money. Uh, increased use of money, uh, I will not talk much about that. Uh, what we know about money, it should be acceptable, trustworthy, what a view, this one I think is... Uh, then in terms of uh, concepts, uh, when we talk of dollarization as a concept, dollarization, <coughs> dollarization, is, as the governor said, dollarization is the use of a currency other than the currency of a given country. So even using the rand is randization is dollarization. Conceptually. It's not using US dollars, dollarization. Fine. But when we talk when we talk of full dollarization or formal dollarization, what what it would mean is that we would have an agreement with the US monetary authorities to use the US dollar. In our case, we don't have that. So what we're just doing, we are using their currency and it's okay. So we don't have really full dollarization. But full dollarization would have its advantages in the sense that uh, with, fu with full dollarization, Zimbabwe would benefit from what is called synergy. Yeah. The, the, the resources that are derived by the monetary authorities from printing money, so we would get a share of it, which is what we are missing now because we are not form we don't have a formal agreement. We are just using their currency. So randomization, uh, I suppose, uh, when you're talking about also even randomization, which is also dollarization, we would also need a formal agreement with the monetary authorities in South Africa to use it. So I'll skip some of the... But you see, what happened with the, with, with the multi-currency system, what it meant was that the monetary authorities were no longer in a position to print money. That is why we ended up with the phenomenon of deflation. But we, now, uh, we, there, there are effective ways in which we are effectively printing money. And I hope that will be uh, also brought under control. Yeah, these treasury bills and what have you. Uh, so there's a uh, policy credibility. We don't really fear that the, the, the government, uh, not the government, but the central bank is going to print money because it's illegal to print U.S. dollars. Uh, illegally, you can't. Uh, then we are talking about uncertainty, risk of devaluation. I'll skip that. Uh, but you see, when you have full dollarization, the cost would be like loss of monetary sovereignty. You would now have no control over monetary policy. You can't use changes in money supply to influence the level of economic activity. A loss of, a loss of land of last resort, when banks run short of funds, as a last resort, they go to the central bank to get liquidity, but at the moment they are constrained. So I think this one, uh, we can also skip this. Uh, so in our case, if we wanted to run dice, would have to go to the South African authorities and ask for permission. And I think we generally people are not keen to do that, isn't it? They, we would be quite keen because of also issues to do with sovereignty. Because really our, our, our monetary policy would then be, uh, in a way, uh, under the control of, uh, uh, of a foreign ca uh, country. But randomization, there's this talk about randomization. In a way, my good friend was here, Mr. Ashok Chakrabat who is one of the apostles of this, uh, this issue of, um, of randomization. What are the advantages of the, 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 the rand? They say the rand is a weaker currency, so that it will make our exports more competitive. But as the governor was saying, you don't just get runs, you have to end them. In fact, the basic difference between local currency and foreign currency is that foreign currency you have to end, you have to export or attract foreign direct investment. Local currency you can print. Yeah. So the idea is that uh, uh, if we run dice, if we use the rand, uh, then we'll be more competitive because the cost structure in Zimbabwe, a, U a US based economy is quite costly. But as the central bank has been saying over the years, there's what is called internal devaluation, that we can really lower the cost of production in this country. For instance, 
if we all agreed in this economy that we halve our salaries, it will, uh, it will affect our salary levels, but in real terms, if prices were also to come down by half, effectively, it will, we will not be worse off. So it is possible to actually lower prices, lower salaries, and still have the same standard of living. At times people confuse the cost of living with the standard of living. The cost of living may be very high, but the standard is very low. But we are saying, so we are saying, there are quite a number of ways that we can make ourselves uh, more competitive. Uh, the monetary union, I'm not going to say much about it, but there is what is called the uh, rent monetary union. So there is a possibility that we could actually join a monetary union where we use a common currency, like the rand. And we can use that rand without our same dollar, in which case it will be uh, equivalent to what we're talking about, randization. But we can also have a, a situation where we join the rand monetary union with our same dollar. Uh, but before we join a monetary union, there should be convergence in terms of our monetary and fiscal policies. So the fiscal deficits, and in terms of our monetary policy, and also as the governor uh, illustrated, inflation rates, they have to be similar. So there's a cost to it, there has to be convergence for us to be good members of that, uh, of that monetary union. Uh, Reintroduction of the, 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 the governor has already talked about the fundamentals that are required for the Zim dollar to come back. That uh, for us to reintroduce the, 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 to reintroduce the Zim dollar by whatever name, uh, our economy should be perfect, performing well. So the basic point I'm making is that our crisis is not a crisis of currency, it's a crisis of production. Uh, just a minute. Uh, but the advantage with if we were to reintroduce the Zim dollar and people accepted it, and I don't see it happening soon, is that uh, we will then have the advantage of synergy that will be able to print the money. But we, I mean, there are ways of printing it anyway. Bond notes, bond notes, bond notes really have played their 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 role. Uh, they were able to stabilize. A price volatility. They lowered inflation. Uh, sorry, well, well, sorry. When I talk about the bond notes, there is the cash shortage. Uh, but of course, there is a. But one of the arguments which the central bank was making at the time was that the advantage with bond notes is that they are not externalizable. Mm. But we are told that if you run short of a bond dollar, a bond notes, if you go to Park Station or you go to Lusaka and really. There's a lot of, I mean, the, the bonus are there. Yeah. And I guess one of the main reasons is because it's a store of value, because of this nominal one-to-one -one relationship. So bond notes, for me, I have no problems with bond notes, and I want to commend the uh, central bank for not, for being quite disciplined about the bond notes, in the sense that up to now, it's one sixty million dollars worth of bond notes, is it? Sir? It's now 175. Out of a facility of 200 million. Yes. So what they've done, it doesn't make sense to have money which is not backed by something. As I was saying, I know that in 2008, you could be a trillionaire or whatever you really. Yeah, you but as you were going to the village, you still be unable to purchase drinks and whatever. Yeah. So it's not about money. What makes us richer is not more money, but more goods and services. Yeah. So as far as I, I am concerned, the current arrangement is a very good arrangement. The, the, the current arrangement where we have a multi-current system, where the ranch is also part of that monetary, uh, of the multi-current system. And the selection of the currencies that are in that basket is based on trade between Zimbabwe and those countries. So really, I, I consider the current arrangement as an optimal one. Uh, Talking about the, the rand, it's not globally accepted. People really don't really. So I'm quite happy with the uh, with the current arrangement. Conclusion: Currency is not 
the issue of problem. Long queues are a reflection of the uh, of low production. I did write this after the governor's presentation, actually, I had done this before. So I think really that, that, that issue is really, it's an issue of production. It's, a, it's an issue of production. Uh, so at the moment, we have a lot of idle capacity, so which can be used to, so that we produce more, we export, then we can earn. So focus should be on increasing production via internal devaluation, which I've already referred to, uh, the efforts towards ease of doing business, policy consistency, that really, when government really uh, comes up with a policy, it sticks to it, uh, then supply of bottlenecks within the facility. But I understand you are also looking for extending the facility. We are looking for a facility. Oh, they are looking for a facility. A first day before we build it. Yeah, fine, that's okay, that's fine, that's fine. Then the regional integration. Uh, thank you very much, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Madu, uh, for the presentation. Very instructive. I think there are a lot of parallels that comes uh, from the academic presentation with what we had uh, from the previous presentation from the government of the Arab Egypt. So in this session, we are going to have uh, two presentations. And after that, we are going to open up the floor for questions from, uh, from the audiences. So um, the next presenter is going to be uh, Mr. Asali. Sorry. Ah, okay, before Mr. Asali from you uh, uh, comes to do his presentation, we are going to have a discussion for, uh, for the same presentation, which is just uh, uh, ended. And Mr. Kaseki is going to do that. Can you come up front and uh, leave the program? No, it's Mr. Zembe. Dr. Gomez is not here. They played the first one. Yeah. For me. I don't know where this arrangement was done. I just hate my name being called. That I should be discussing for my sins, I suppose. Okay, thanks. Just to summarize, okay, the presentation by Dr. Kadenge. It's not a cash crisis, it's a production crisis. The purpose of currents are three, three major purposes that we mentioned. Restoration of value, medium of exchange, and the unit of account. And that what we do have is a lack of confidence. And that lack of confidence is basically as a result of uncertainty in our environment. Where you say when people go to the bank, what they want is their money. If they get their money, then there's no problem. If their money restores their value, maintains value, then there's no problem. Because that's basically the purpose of money, what you use it for. Full dollarization versus sovereignty that when we go full dollarization, obviously there are issues of sovereignty that will be lost there. And do we want as a country to lose our sovereignty and lose our control? And most of is the value of the US currency and its strength vis-a-vis -vis our fundamentals in the economy. Randomization, structural transformation from a hard currency to a soft currency. And just bear in mind, when you say soft currency, you are saying a weak currency. <laughs> and increase, okay, money increase in money supply. When we do randomization, I'm not so sure whether it will increase money because, you know, money is a reflection of your production. Okay, but if there, unless there is production, if, no matter whatever currency we go to, unless we produce, it will still come short. We will still have the challenges that we have. So this is why I totally agree in terms of the fundamental to say it is production, it is productivity. Those are the issues that we need to really address. And also to address the issue of uncertainty in our environment. And I'm sure we find with the presentation done by the governor here and what they are doing. And this is why the presenter eventually said this option in terms of the optimal choice of currents is the current arrangement where we have got the multi current system and also backed by now the bond note. All we want from the bond note, whatever you call it, you can call whatever that currency is, call it whatever it is, as long as it does one of the two most important things. Number one, 
restoration of the value of our assets or your wealth. And number two, whether you can be able to exchange to do trade with that currency. That's what it is. And that's what you need from your currency. No matter what, whatever you want to call it. So that's where we need to be able to gravitate towards in terms of our discourse, our discussions, and our dialogue from a policy point of view to say how best do we create certainty in our environment. Certainty that will then ensure that even if it is the bond in the current arrangement where the bond is we want to want to the US dollar. And that is why the uptake and the acceptance levels have been good and they've been high at this point in time. And this is where we are, would like to kindly request our governor who is here, just to make sure that we don't lose that parity on one-to-one. -one. Because the day we lose that parity on one-to-one, -one, that will be the end of the economy. In fact, it will be worse than 2008. And that's what is important. Otherwise, yes, okay, fine. Our current arrangement, it's good. It's managing to facilitate the medium of exchange. What we, know, what we need for Forex, as has been said, is production, production, and production, and productivity. And once we do that, then we're able to generate whatever the forex we need to be able to then finance all the other various activities that we need. Thank you very much, and I think that was basically what has come through. And my one of the observations in terms of this is to say, yes, the current arrangement has long as, and you just need to help the governor to take your power. <laughs> you will maintain the parity. <laughs> if he maintains that parity, we have absolutely no issues to worry about. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hassan, for the presentation. I think next, um, next you are going to have a presentation from. So our next presentation is going to come from uh, New Hope, and we have Mr. Um, Asali, who is the, um, the head of Arabic department at New Hope College. So can we also, can we try to stick to our allocated time of 50 minutes, because we are a bit behind time. So can we have Mr. Asali coming to do his presentation? Uh, thank you, uh, Director of Ceremony. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the uh, coming of uh, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, Dr. John Mangunda, uh, the Provost Chancellor of the University, Professor Mashiri, uh, General Faculty of Arts, uh, Professor Mwati, uh, all protocols observed, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my, my, my speech would uh, maybe at the first instance seem uh, disconnected to what's going on here because <laughs> the two previous speakers were talking of currency and now we've switched from currency to Arabic language. But uh, by the end of the speech, I, I would argue that uh, uh, Arabic language uh, has got a link because the, the, the topic of uh, the heading of my topic is the importance of Arabic language to Zimbabwean business. So I think it will turn and it will be in sync with what we are discussing here. Uh, before going uh, to how uh, Arabic can actually benefit Zimbabwean business, maybe we'll need a, a, small, or a, 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 a small introduction about Arabic language. Well, Arabic language uh, is international, uh, is the uh, official language of the United Nations. And in recognition of that, uh, the United Nations itself uh, uh, instituted the International Arabic Day, which is 18 December every year, they celebrate every year. And they did this in recognition of multilingualism and cultural diversity. And also, at our closer home in our continent, Arabic language is also one of the working languages of the African Union. So it is a language which is of uh, significant international uh, importance. And also, it is spoken by 300 million people uh, in, the, in, in the world. Those are first language speakers. And of course, uh, we know in the world there are 
uh, billion plus Muslims, and this Muslim thing, one way or the other, they use Arabic language, because that's the language of revelation uh, of the Islamic texts. So that is uh, the, the, the Arabic, as far as Arabic is concerned. And of course, in the past, Arabic was very significant in that uh, there was a time in the past, it was the lingua franca of the world in that uh, Arabic community, the arts, the sciences, and even the Arabic scholars uh, like Avicenna, uh, he, his books were studied in, uh, uh, in Western universities, even Averroes, in terms of philosophy. So there was a time when Arabic uh, uh, was important in the world, and also a few words uh, in English uh, are from uh, Arabic, like the word Admiral is from the Arabic word uh, Amir al and so on. So we've got a number of uh, examples of that. Anyway, that's not our, our point of discussion, but it was just a necessary introduction to give us uh, the, the right focus. Now, uh, going back to our topic, Arabic is vital because it is the language spoken by the people of the Middle East, a region which has abundant oil and gas. Uh, the region is famed for its high GDP and purchasing power. Saudi Arabia alone is a GDP of $646 billion. This is the 2015 uh, figure. Therefore, we as a country may benefit from this through direct trade, investment, tourism, and the educational sector. Uh, so let's see that now Saudi Arabia has got this uh, huge amount of money. Uh, do they part uh, with it? Do they invest it? So let's see. Are there any current examples of that? Yes, indeed, there are current examples. In February, King Salman of Saudi Arabia visited Indonesia, uh, and the Al Jazeera website reported that Indonesia, from that visit, they expected 25 billion in inbound uh, investment. That's 25 billion US dollars. And then during the same trip, King Salman also visited Malaysia, and in that trip, the, the 7 billion agreement was concluded between the Mal Malaysian state oil firm Petronas in Saudi Ar Aramco. So this agreement will see Saudi investment flow into an oil refinery and petrochemical project. Yes, we can say now these are even figures, you know, Malaysia and Indonesia. This is South East Asia, so what's the link to us? Well, I'll inform you that in South Africa, the Saudis had a $5 billion rand solar project with, in the Northern Cape. That was last year, 2016. So it means that South, the Saudis are ready to invest in Africa, because if they can invest in South Africa, then they can do it here. So it's a matter of us uh, uh, marketing ourselves and uh, uh, engaging them. So we as Zimbabweans, how, could we, how can we access that money? How relevant is Arabic this story? Well, it's, in, it's irrelevant in that uh, we can focus on uniquely Zimbabwean products, and this can give us a competitive edge, edge of uh, Zimbabwean investments. And this is enhanced by writing proposals, having websites, books, brochures with pertinent information written in Arabic. If an Arab businessman reads about Zimbabwean business opportunities in his own language, that will do away with language barriers and possible miscommunication. Yes, you can talk of translation, but translation is not always effective, and it has caused problems in the past. I think uh, most of you would be aware of that during the Cold uh, War uh, period, the United States and, and Russia, they were not in good books. And that was further increased by the fact that in, in, during one of uh, their meetings, uh, the, 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 the President Khrushchev was speaking in Russian, and he said, he made a statement in Russian, and the translator said, the, uh, he said, we will bury you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was not, the, the translation was too literal, it caused further problems. So he actually said, we are, we are going to outlast you. So translation does not always work because there's translation laws, you know, there's untranslated BBC and a lot of factors. So translation is not always the best solution. So what we can do is Zimbabwe is let's learn the language and engage with them in their own terms. And that will help us whether it's on a, on a government level or whether it's on a private level. So we need the language. And so that is as far as uh, a business is concerned. And of course, we at New York College uh, can come, uh, come through here through providing short courses in Arabic We've got a diploma in the Arabic language which will enable Zimbabweans to communicate easily with the Arab world. And moreover, Arabic is a language which is uh, strongly linked to Islam. Uh, the Muslims, you know, they believe in eating halal. I think we've heard this word uh, halal, or even when we, we see in some food packets they are, they are marked halal. Now, that itself is an industry on its own. That is a 2.3 trillion global industry. Right? Because when we say halal, 
the Muslims they eat food which is prepared in a manner which confirms to the religion. Mm. So we can benefit from that by exporting products to the Arab world in some world. Remember, the Arab world, the Middle East, is a desert. So they need product, they need, they need fruit, they need uh, there's a, a, a great export market for, for meat, goods, and so on. Uh, poultry, they even import from, from Brazil. So if they import from Brazil that far, why not here Zimbabwe is near? So we can make use of that. And in this regard, there's the ninth edition of the Halal Export Dubai, which will be held at the Roger and Bustan Hotel from 17 September to 19 September 2017. It is being organized by Orange Fairs and Events. This will focus on a number of business verticals, including food, beverage, fashion, cosmetics, personal care products, travel, tourism, hospitality, banking, and finance. Now, this will be beneficial if some Zimbabweans could go there and see how we can exploit that. We, we, we certainly need a channel of that 2.3 trillion industry. We need that. Uh, so, uh, we know, so if you also go there, uh, knowing Arabic, then you, you will benefit a lot. Uh, also, Okay, Zimbabwe also has got unique places for tourism, like the Victoria Falls. That's one of the seven wonders of the world. You don't find it anywhere else, unless, of course, if the Zambians can argue that we've got the Victoria Falls. But we can say the best view of the Victoria Falls is from Zimbabwe. And uh, uh, so, how do we benefit from this? We can have information about this. Uh, the Ministry of Tourism can have brochures, books, and so forth in Arabic. Right now, we don't have information about Zimbabwe, but Zimbabwe is in Arabic. So if an Arab wants to know about Zimbabwe, he types an Arabic statement on Google, he won't get any information. So that's a gap which we can fill by having uh, uh, information. That we write, we tell our own story, and then we market ourselves and show how unique we are, and we get those visitors from those places uh, to come to this country. And also, in, in Zimbabwe, we've got seven uh, embassies uh, from Arab countries. So we could actually go to them and give them the information with a view of attracting uh, tourists uh, to this country. Uh, and that would be very uh, uh, beneficial. And also in terms of education, the Arabs, they, English is not their, their, their official language, but they need it to deal with the world. So here we've got institutions of higher learning. I uh, heard uh, uh, Dr. Mouad, uh, Professor Mouad saying that use it is uh, the, the best institution in terms of learning. So the, the institution and other players also could offer courses, you know, uh, in English, business English, conversation skills, and so on. And this can attract students from those countries. And here, there's a talk of, 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 of Forex. They will pay in Forex. We make them pay. We say, look, uh, English is our official language. Come and train you. And then they can come. Because sometimes they go and spend time in uh, countries where English is the official language. They even go to South Africa, they go to Cape Town. So we can target that market and say, come also to Zimbabwe. You, you learn, you teach, we will learn you, I mean, we will teach you, and then you can qualify, you pay for fees. When they come and stay for three months or six months, they will pay the fees, and they will pay the, the for services, and then this can boost our economy. Therefore, Arabic language presents a wide range of business opportunities and potential for considerable financial gain to the public sector, the private sector and to individuals. I thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's quite um, instructive coming from a different uh, dimension. We had originally wanted to have a question and answer immediately after this presentation, but because of time, we are moving f f forward to the next two presenters. So I'm calling upon um, Dr. Kasege from the University of Zimbabwe. Uh, uh, Father comments to do his presentation. Then uh, immediately after him, we are also going to have Mr. Darwinga uh, representing the. Sorry. Okay. So for now, we can have Dr. Kasege um, deliver his presentation.
I still remember our Minister of Finance saying that there is no smoke that is coming from the industry. We now have to look in terms of the strategic one industry, for example, CSC, for example, Zisco. Those are the strategic industries because uh, the removal of uh, Zisco from the normal one production system resulted in Wange going down. The whole Kwege is now like a dead town because there is no production. And, that, and also, again, even the reinforcement steel that we are now using in terms of construction, we are importing. Which means those are things that we have to look at in terms of which ones are the strategic what industry and we focus in terms of what those are. Now, this is also another area that we should look at. Look in terms of productivity for 2016 in the matter of value what terms. Compare Zimbabwe and compare Zambia. I always want to use Zambia because we used to be ahead of Zambia. Now we are behind what Zambia in terms of productivity. If you want now to compare this, Zambia is almost three times better than us in terms of productivity. And if now looking in terms of South Africa, I don't know how many times. So if you now look in terms of that, this is the reason why we are all importing from South Africa because South Africa are very cheap on the basis of what law production, what cost. Then if you now look in terms of uh, this, uh, I was hoping that the government was going to talk in terms of this. Uh, this is also another area that we should really focus on in terms of seriously. These are remittances, and this is another problem that we now have in, in the economy. We can't have remittances higher greater than what our foreign direct investment in the, in the economy. We now look in terms of our figures of foreign direct what investment. They are far, far below what remittances. And what type of remittances are we receiving? Am I a I need to buy pills. My pills. Consumption what? Uh, remittances. So we need now to improve in terms of what the forms of remittances that we are also what, uh, receiving. And some measures, I think, they are already put in place in terms of how we can what, uh, improve what uh, remittances. Now, if we now look in terms of our balance of payment, I just want to be very quick. Uh, we now realize even the project in 2016, the current account is negative, which means we are still in the dire problem as a, what, as a country. Now, if we now look in terms of also what the trends, look in terms of what the balance of change is negative, which means Again, the industry is not doing what much in terms of what uh, trying to promote what exports. And now look in terms of how we can enhance what these exports, which are the major source of what of currency in the country. Look in terms of ease of what trading across uh, uh, borders. Zimbabwe in terms of what time to export with the number of what days as compared to other what other uh, 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 countries. Even if you look in terms of what time to import, again, there are some delays in terms of what importing other countries for even hours other than what days. So these are all issues that we now have to look at. And now, what do we have to do in terms of industry for us to be able to be what, uh, cost effective? We have not looked in terms of what is to do with what infrastructure. One of the elements of infrastructure is this to do with what electricity, which we experience what focus. How best can we make sure that this industry is actually what and doing what very well and don't have what is what focus. Now, if you now look in terms of one of the major cost driver in the industry that they're always what crying about, look in terms of this one what cost a uh, uh, kilowatt watt hour, the estimated cost of a kilowatt watt hour for industry, and now compare with other what, countries, the estimated what cost per watt per kilowatt hour, which means our electricity is always very expensive. And if we fit this into the production what function, I think economists are here, if you are not using the production function, if one element of the production function is very high, it means that overall cost will also be what will be high. Then if we now look in terms of what the minimum wage versus uh, the ratio of minimum wage to value what added. Now realize South Africa, example, they are actually what doing what very well. Labor is adding less as compared to what to Zimbabwe. And these are the issues that we now have to look at in terms of how best can we improve our production so that labor, which is a major cost driver, would also be what less contributing in terms of, of our production as compared to what to other aspects. Now we now look in terms of this to do with what cost of water in Zimbabwe. It's averaging about what? Uh, 71 cents, per about 1,001 liters. If you now look in terms of South Africa, it's up to 6,000, which are free. And in Zambia, as well as Botswana, there's no charge. Now, if our products are going to South Africa, given that South Africa would want free charge in terms of water, in terms of what the basic, it always 
translate to that our products are expensive more than those of what uh, of Zambia and this do this translate, let me not talk about it. But my main emphasis is in terms of how can we attract deposits and how can we have financial public what confidence so that we can also what improve that. This do with what attract what deposits. I suggest uh, Governor you are here today. I uh, was one of the guys who are arguing against the board notes, but now I'm confessing, I have accepted this of what. <laughs> but we now realize that if somebody sends, for example, sends 10,000 into Zimbabwe, yes, you can give me 5% as a form of what reward. But is it enough for me to be able to continue on sending money? I hope and think that maybe if you could put an interest rate to 10, to those who are sending money to Zimbabwe, that would wait for what for the case of what Zimbabwe. We also have to encourage what people to save for long what periods. When we were growing up, we used to save the red book in terms of periods. But nowadays, it's transitory money. It comes from this pipe, it also goes out using what the other pipe. Then this to do with how we can also what attract what investment. What are the measures that we can do to attract what foreign direct investment can and also I think I've already commented in the past the use of what plastic man because that's now the move and that's now the drive. And I also encourage that law, as the Reserve Bank, we should lower our tariffs or our costs in terms of what transactional man using advocates. Because if you go to uh, Kenya, you can buy vegetables from your neighbor using only what education, there's no problem. But in Zimbabwe, we still have what, some challenges. I think for the uh, sake of time, let me end there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hasek, for the presentation. Um, because of time, we are moving on to the uh, next presenter, uh, who is going to be Mr. Tarwinga. Sorry, before, before we move on to the next presenter, we are going to have a discussion for the previous presentation. And we have Mr. Uh, Dr. G. Uh, Mugano from the he's an, he's an Economist. He's an Okay, I've just been informed that the discussion is not around, so we are moving on to the next presentation. Uh, Mr. Tarawiga is available. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to say the list of ceremonies, all protocols observed. Uh, we want to thank uh, the University of Zimbabwe for inviting us, the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, to this presentation. I know that it has been a long day and we are only going to go to lunch, so I want to take much of your time. Uh, my topic today is on gaps in financial and business reporting. Can we move to the next slide? Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, the scope of my presentation is uh, basically on four items. I want to speak about the roles of the stock exchange, first of all, and then I will cover what we believe are the roles of the media and the capital markets, and then we will address the issue of the gaps that we have observed and what we think should be the way forward. Okay, technology is letting us down. But uh, let me explain to you what the roles of the stock exchange are. Basically, there are three functions that the stock exchange plays in an economy. The fundamental one being an intermediation role, where we facilitate uh, sectors of the economy that are in need of capital to raise capital. That is the first role. The second aspect is to do with corporate restructuring. We facilitate companies that want to do major acquisitions 
and take over us as our business. And lastly, is the second market trade that we are all probably familiar with because it's the most reported. That's the first role of intermediation. The second aspect that we play as the stock exchange is the regulatory function. We regulate issuers or companies that are listed on the stock exchange. And this regulation is in terms of the issuers as well as the stock brokers. And I want to emphasize that it is because of the regulation that no man, companies or investors find it uh, comfortable to come and invest on the listed companies. The last function that we provide is that of providing information. And this is information to both investors and policymakers. Now this is where the media, where financial and business reporters come in, the provision of information, which is my next topic. From our perspective, the major functions of business and financial reporters is to inform, to educate, and to monitor. I would want to read out the quote on your left side, which says that if you don't start any companies, you have the same success buying stocks as you do in a poker game, if you bet without looking at your cards. What that statement simply says is that before you make an investment decision, you have to analyze something, you have to look at information. And for this aspect, we find that business and financial reporters are critical. Let me expand on those three areas. In terms of informing, it is essential to note that investment decisions are driven by information. When someone is making a decision to buy equal shares, it's not that they like the name or the company, but it's based on information which they have about equal which makes them probably expect some more form of return from their investment. If someone is making an investment decision, either in the money market, again, it's based on information. Now, the information that is normally disseminated include the financials, which is the financial reports from companies, the corporate actions, and the market statistics. The corporate actions covers your issues like your rights issues, if there are dividend announcements, uh, if there are major movements within a company, probably a company is under takeover or they are intended to do a, a major transaction. All such, we call it price sensitive information. And that information should be spread publicly. Now, finance, financial and business reports constitute part of the media that are used to reduce the information asymmetry. By information asymmetry, we are saying, in any uh, corporate setup, there are what we call insiders, which are the people that are close to the organization, mostly the executives, management, and the boards, who in most cases have got an advantage to have the information about that corporate before anyone else. But for the orderly function of the market, it is essential that information flows to everyone so that there is less disparities between the information that the insiders have and the general public. Why is that necessary? You may have had issues of uh, insider trading which distort or brings uh, no confidence to markets. So if the financial reporters don't help in reducing that information asymmetry, instances of insider trading are going to rise. And as a result, it will lead to lower confidence in our markets by potential investors. The last item on the information day is that by providing information, financial reporters therefore play a crucial role in ensuring that capital market values, securities correct. So the valuation of securities, like I said, when someone is making an investment decision, it's based on information. And that decision is going to lead to a valuation of the company. The media should play its role in that aspect to lead to correct valuations. And secondly, to ensure that capital is allocated to deserving institutions. 
So if a corporate is performing well, that should be informed to the market, and investors should then make a decision whether to allocate capital to that company. If someone is not behaving well as a corporate, probably the punishment is that the media is informing the investing public and less capital is allocated to that institution. The second aspect that the media or the financial and business reporters can play is the education aspect. Now we are saying this is a step further from just informing. Here it's now more value addition, where you are now probably simplifying complex financial terms for the benefit of the general public, or expanding where there is a financial statement, you are probably giving your expert opinion on the financials, so that the general public is educated or is with more information so that it can probably have a better understanding of the information that is provided. And lastly, the monitoring aspect. Here we are saying in addition to providing information and educating the public, the media or the business and financial reporters also play a crucial role of ensuring that markets operate efficiently by pointing out irregularities. So you are the whistleblowers, but the whistleblowing are not saying it's uh, sniffing for scandals. We are saying play an active role to ensure that capital markets are functioning properly. Point out irregularities or areas where you think probably regulators are not aware of, and corrective action can then be taken. Or point out misbehavior by corporate that probably the regulators are not aware of, and then probably corrective action can then be taken. Those are what we perceive to be the, the, the three key functions of uh, the business and financial uh, reporters. Now, in terms of the gaps, here we look at it from both aspects. That is to do with the reporters as well as from our regulatory point of view. Before anything is actually published from the stock exchange perspective, there are listings requirements that companies have to abide by. Now, there are gaps from that initial perspective that the listings requirements or the disclosure requirements which are currently enforced in the market, there are limitations to them. And then we're also going to look at the shortcomings from the actual coverage. In terms of the regulatory requirements, what we have are listings requirements that were last reviewed in 2002. That's more than uh, 14 years ago. And uh, over that period, we've gone through hyperinflation, we've gone through a multi currency environment. In short, the environment has been changing constantly, but we have remained with static rules that are now proving to be inadequate in terms of pertinent issues like sustainability, for example. These are new concepts that are emerging. Corporate governance, we recently have been adopted a code of corporate governance as a country, which is not enshrined in the current listing requirements. So there's a limitation in terms of the regulatory requirements. And sometimes when we try to enforce disclosure, we are challenged because we don't have the basis to stand on. The basis is limited. So there's a shortcoming there. There are also no penalties in the current listing requirements that we can use. The only route that is there is either suspension or delisting, which are, in our perspective, uh, not in the best interest at the moment. So that's one area where we have noted again. Then from the media coverage, I took this clip from one of our uh, recent publication, and this is the media, or the financial report actually saying something about themselves. They were saying 2015 was a forgettable year on the ZSC. Trades have declined drastically, and so too has the exchange market capitalization. So much has been written on this subject by various analysts, but as has been the case in most instances, when it comes to national discourse, be it political or business, debates are largely stayed by emotion. 
and good old pragmatism and rationality are thrown away. This is from a newspaper, a reporter. They actually acknowledge their shortcoming. That sometimes it's not always facts that are distributed. Emotions sometimes take over and we sometimes lose our senses or we forget the rational aspects of it. So what, what have we then observed? What the first observation is probably there's a conflict between trying to generate cells and reporting information. And the need probably to drive cells then dominates. And as a result, you find sometimes there are confirmed stories that are being published without authenticating. And sometimes there are factual errors as well. There was another clip which I did actually take out, which with the red line of ZSC is background. And uh, the story went on to say there are only two employees at the stock exchange, which are factually incorrect. But it was published in a widely read paper. So we are thinking probably this is a story that can sell paper, but it's factually incorrect. The second observation is there is limited financial literacy, probably from some of the financial reporters. I'm sure the government was uh, trying to elucidate us on some of the concepts um, that are affecting the cash or the, the cash situation in the country. And sometimes the interpretation is lost if we are, the, the, the level of literacy is limited. So that's, those are the two observations from us, that probably there's an overriding need to drive cells, which sometimes dominates rationality. And secondly, we also observe that there's limited financial literacy. Yeah. Some of our reporters um, don't have adequate information on the capital markets, and we can't blame them. There are no institutions that are providing that training. So what do we think should be the way forward? For us to address, firstly from our own perspective, is the issue of the new listings requirements, which we are doing or we have uh, almost 90% done. And we hope that with the new listings requirements, it will provide a wider scope for, a more, for more disclosures and to also have penalties for non-compliance. And we also believe that there is need for financial literacy training, which in our own small way as the stock exchange has been doing, we have been moving around universities and schools to try and um, interact with students on how the capital markets function. But I think at a national level, there is need for financial uh, disclosure, financial reporting training. We have seen institutions being set up in Nigeria, they've got a center for financial journalism, which actually trains journalists on financial matters. And we think it's also pertinent to our, to our situation. The other aspect that we are proposing is, um, is probably that financial and business reporters should also understand their target market. The major target market for financial information is the investor. Be they the current and potential. And the information that is provided should address the needs of these uh, investors. The other target market is the regulators and the general public. So the level of information should be portrayed in a way that uh, covers that. And lastly, is also to assess the impact of whatever report that is going out. Because to them, uh, other issues like the cost to issuers, uh, we have had some companies that we get to now incur costs to correct some information that has been published and which is not factually correct, and that's a cost. And secondly, is to do with the image of the capital markets. That headline which I referred to, the ZSC is bankrupt. We are in a situation where we are trying to lure foreign investors so that we can have foreign currency. But if they see such a headline, that the institution where they are intended to invest money on this bankrupt, it is not correct. What then develops that perception and of a high country risk and the ultimate thing is no investment comes through. So we are simply urging our reporters to also consider these aspects, consider the image of the capital markets and the image of the country.
because what you portray is not only read locally, but it is a wide audience and wide repercussions. Uh, let me thank you for listening. I hope I haven't eaten much of your time. Thank you, Mr. Tarawika. For this presentation, we are going to have um, another discussion. Uh, discussant, Mrs. Richard, uh, managing editor from Zero. In, uh, unfortunately, we are only going to give you just three minutes because of our time. And after, after that, we are opening the floor to questions from the, from the audience. Thank you very much, and it's uh, good to be here. Um, I'm always excited. I've been in the uh, journalism field for a long time. Uh, all I can say is just over two decades. If I tell you how many years, then you can begin to calculate my years. I'm not very old, I'm still very young, but I've been in this profession for a long time. And 19 of those years have been on the business desk, so I'm quite passionate about uh, journalism, especially business and financial reporting. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Tarika, for your uh, presentation. Just to summarize, he was talking about, initially he spoke about the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, the role of the Stock Exchange. I think we all know the general information of the role of the Stock Exchange, and he rightly pointed out that from the media perspective, we normally speak uh, just about trading, which share price went up, which share price went down, things like that. Sometimes as, as, as business and financial reporters, we do not get deeper into its other roles, although sometimes we do. Um, it's, it's also involved in restructuring majors, um, sector market trading, as I've mentioned, it said so, and also provision of, of information where you pointed out that journalism systems play a very critical role in ensuring that the information is, is, is taken out there. Not just the raw, but also there's need for some in-depth analysis and interpretation of that kind of um, information. He also spoke about uh, major functions of, of the media, which he says were to inform, educate, and monitor. I like the way he moved the way to entertain, because we normally say it's to educate, inform, and entertain. So I think he was not too comfortable in getting to think of internet world and stuff. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, on, on, on informing, he, 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 pointed, he, he spoke about very critical thoughts. You know, there is no better journalist than an informed journalist. If you are not well informed, then you cannot interpret and you cannot analyze because you don't understand. If you are writing a story about derivatives, what, what does that mean? Unless you know that kind of stuff, then you can communicate to the reader, to the investor who, who needs that information to make a decision. Be it a company executive needs that information. So I'm subscribed to his notion that he said that indeed we need journalists that are trained and informed. But unfortunately in this country and maybe other parts of, of Africa, uh, journalists are just trained like in general. To be any kind of journalist, you go through the same training for the two years or the three years or four years. There is no particular specialization in all institutions of higher learning. So that is very critical. Because if you want me to be a business and financial journalist, then I need the training. I need to know the words and you know, all those issues that are within that period, that aspect of, 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 of journalism. I cannot write about financial uh, issues when I don't understand them. If I can't read the balance sheet, how do you expect me to interpret it to the investor or to the reader or to the policy maker or whoever is interested? So it is critical that the journalists be empowered. And I'm, I'm happy to be here that we have this, um, the UZ Department of, of Arts is launching uh, this degree program that will train uh, journalists in economics and, and reporting because that is critical. I think I know at Rhodes University they have a chair of economics where journalists from across Africa actually are trained from South Africa and from the rest of the continent go through training and annually they review um, the, the business and financial reporting so that they can improve. So that is very critical. If we are to empower journalists in Zimbabwe, that's important. We have so many newspapers in this uh, country that, that are business newspapers. But uh, have you wondered why these business newspapers that come out weekly are always reporting the majority on the politics? It is because I know the politics, the political story carries the day. But once I say I'm identified as a business caper, I should write about business and finance mostly easily. But then there is no capacity 
to really delve into the deeper issues of the business and financial sector. So once institutions like the university help, it will go a long way in really, really, really making that, that sector or that kind of reporting very vibrant. It can be done, it should be done, it must be done. And I think we can change it, a lot can happen. There are so many gaps. The other reason why there's not been that vibrant reportage is the state of the economy. Sometimes some of these terms we begin to forget them. I think I mentioned one of my derivatives. Most of you people don't even know what they are. I must also even go to search the books to what are they by the way to get the deeper understanding because we have not written about them because our capital markets are not as functional as they should be. The economy is facing critical challenges. I think the governor gave us um, a rundown of the state of the economy. Uh, so in that circumstance, it, it sort of limits the journalists or as how far they can go and what they can write about because they can't write about things that are not there. Although it will be critical, but I think we need an economy that is a bit more vibrant so that our, our reporters can also be vibrant. And then another challenge that we often have is uh, we always call ourselves reporters. Yes, the reporters and, and journalists, we, we, we sort of exchange these, but I want to believe they need differently. If you call me a reporter, definitely I'm going to report on what happened in this meeting. I will not analyze it. But if you call me a journalist, you are equipping me, you are empowering, empowering me to say, okay, I can report about what happened. I can also analyze, I can be given a more critical assessment of what happened. We had a meeting here at this symposium where this one and this one spoke, and then I, I leave it at that. But if you give me my true title, I can go deeper and analyze why did we dwell more on this topic instead of this one? How did this happen instead of this one? What did Mahmoud say about advertisation and then the other one said this? So you then empower me, you give me more free play to say what I can say. I know I've been given three minutes, I could have said more, but um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Tamwinga for what you said and I hope I've managed to, to summarize a bit of it. I only got a few minutes to do it. But what I want to say is that Zimbabwe is potential economically with the potential, and even in terms of the media, to do the best that we can. But what is required is training, is to empower, is to hold short courses, long courses on business and financial reporting. It's so specialized, you can't expect a, a reporter to just do it. And also institutions like universities like this one, it is critical that um, you be in the forefront. We also need researchers. Universities are centers of research, I want to believe. So we need researchers even on, on, the, on the economy, on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange and other aspects of the economy. Then we can always get these research papers to produce as is or to even interpret them or analyze them for the betterment of our investors and our readers. Because indeed, they rely more on the media as the source of information. So if that can happen, if that can happen, then I think we can make progress. But I want to believe that this is a certain point and we are going somewhere and we will improve one story at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Shizu. Um, we are now opening up the floor for questions. And so what we are going to do is we are opening up two rounds of questions. In each round, we will have five questions. Uh, so the first round of questions can begin now, then we, we have the responsible people uh, taking up the questions. But please, can we also make sure that our questions are quite direct and also very straight to the point and, and brief so that we don't take a lot of time. There's, there's one end of it. Thank you very much, Mr. Tarubinga, for your presentation. My comment relates to uh, the issue of the language that is being used in reporting about these issues of business. One, the business sector is its own language. Two, English is another language that we need you know, to penetrate and understand. I have a problem with our journalists today. They tend to place a lot of emphasis in reporting in English rather than in our local languages. Yet they are reporting for Zimbabwe, of which the bulk of them do not understand you know, some of these languages, like English itself and the business language itself. I'm looking forward to a day where our journalists are also going to place value in reporting in our local languages because the great majority of our citizens are missing out on information because of that language barrier. We are largely reporting in English. Yet our constitution mandates us to treat these languages with parity of esteem. I'm looking for a day 
when we are going to also find reporting in our local language so that we engage and involve everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is, and I think it's directed to everyone who is presented. We seem to have some agreement that uh, our problems are, uh, I mean, we are having a production problem, but uh, don't we have a political problem as well? Because I think that narrative is not coming out, and I'm hoping that perhaps we could have one or two words with regards to how our politics affect our production and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. My question is directed to those who are dealing with the economics or the business side of this issue. My question is, why is Zimbabwe developing other states other than itself? What am I saying? I am saying they were emphasizing production, but the problem I'm seeing, unlike people of old who are not professors or doctors, like the Brahmapada, which were final products from iron, from copper, from everything, and they sold them, which means they are more civilized than us, who are saying we are civilized. Why is Zimbabwe not producing or exporting final products? Why is Zimbabwe exporting tobacco instead of cigarettes? Why is Zimbabwe exporting platinum instead of fine refined products, which fetches more value and which also sustains our economy. Why are we proud of exporting unfinished products? I'm not an economics, but I think this was done by our elders before, prior to 1890. But today, we are failing to do this. I mean, keep your finger up here. Why is Zimbabwe developing other states other than itself? Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I, I have to, because I'm supposed to be out of here about an hour ago. <laughs> right. Um, I should have been a discussant after the presentations on uh, the problems of uh, industry or challenges uh, uh, you know, facing industry. Unfortunately, I have to go, uh, but I've been asked to make a comment. And my comment will obviously be based on the presentations that uh, you know, have been given so far. Uh, I realize that this is not uh, a presentation to economists or you know, business people, but rather uh, students of uh, journalism. Is everybody here students of journalism? Everybody? Okay. All right. For my sins, I was one of the founders of The Source, uh, the online uh, newspaper. I was the founding trustee uh, of The Source, which is being run by, uh, by Reuters or rather funded by Reuters, but you know, uh, run by uh, guys here. I'm no longer a trustee, I think, from the last uh, two years. But I see they uh, produce some uh, you know, uh, business news and so on. My comment really is more <coughs> to do with uh, really understanding uh, our problems in Zimbabwe. I think everybody has said all the nice things, you know. It's the currency, it's the rent, it's, it's all that. <laughs> But I think it's very important for us to say, how did we get there in the first place, right? What is the fundamental problem? We have got a country with a literacy rate of, what is it now, 96%? 94, whatever. Uh, we pride ourselves of that you know, high level of education. Yet, the problems we have are really problems of a very uneducated population. Now that's a very serious contradiction. Decisions that should be made are not made. Why is that? Right? Uh, the governor obviously, you know, went to town about a lot of things. And, and the governor and I, we have quite a few exchanges sometimes about uh, you know, certain issues. All right? I think basically we need to say what is the fundamental reason we have the problems that we have. It affects the analysis that the gentleman from the stock exchange is talking about. I know that. What is the fundamental problem that Zimbabwe has got? We have to understand how this country is governed, you know, because that affects how policy is made. How is policy made in Zimbabwe? It affects your reporting at the end of the day. So I think it is your role as a journalist to invest in understanding how this country is governed, uh, how policy is made, and why certain policies are made. What is the philosophy guiding policy making in Zimbabwe? These are very important questions. And it's nothing to do with being, you know, uh, you know, Zanpier or MTC or anything like that. I think it's a fundamental requirement, right? You can't be a complete journalist or complete reporter if you don't add that aspect to yourself, understanding the philosophy behind which certain uh, you know, policies are made. I mean, for example, uh, you know, indigenization, which nobody ever mentioned, right? I think I was probably one of the first people in this country to say, you know, indigenization shouldn't be done this way, and I still maintain that, all right? Uh, done a lot of work on that, and had a lot of you know, communication and government in those areas, right? But we need to research further, we need to understand a little bit more. I think there are a number of areas that I just want to highlight, you know, to maybe upset some of you, uh, so that you can leave here uh, with an urge to, to do something. What I notice in Zimbabwe basically is that there is a fundamental disjoint between uh, government and the private sector. Okay. The economy, the economy is government and the private sector at the end of the day. All right? And any policies that are made have to have a contribution from both government and private sector. You cannot have a policy that is discussed 
you know, at polyphenol level, and then yes, it becomes you know a policy, and then yes, you know, there's a statutory instrument issued, and then things are happening at the end of the day. And you, as reporters, you're running around to try and understand how they all got there, right? You should be there in the first place so that you're part of that that process, right? So I think the distrust between you know government and private sector is very real. Uh, and you'll find that a number of policies that are made are made to trap our uh, private sector. On the other hand, you know, private sector sits down in boardrooms and comes up with, uh, you know, strategies to outdo, you know, whatever rules and regulations have been put in place. Now, that is problematic. There has to be the bridge between government and private sector in, in policy making. All right? Now, if you look at... Uh, most of the reporting on the economy and all that, it's actually quite negative, all right? It's very, very negative. And of course, you know, the um, investor out there, you know, from, from Saudi Arabia, like my brother, you know, gave a very good presentation about the importance of, uh, you know, learning Arabic, which I think is actually very important that we add languages, you know, in, in our studies at the, at the UZ, right? The, the disjoint between government and private sector is a very serious one in this country, right? Very, very serious. So I think journalists have a role in trying to understand why that is the case and try and drive towards a solution right, in, in your reporting, all right? Um, we talked about sovereignty here. Uh, and sovereignty is obviously very important, but what is sovereignty with a weak economy? You know, you 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 will not be a sovereign state, uh, you know, for a long time if your your economy continues to be very weak. All right. There, there are certain elements, you know, to be able to qualify yourself as a sovereign state, uh, and the fact that we're not using our own currency, to me, is not necessarily a serious compromise on sovereignty. Although you know people make it a big issue, I don't think it is a serious compromise on sovereignty. The key issues are obviously coming up with policies in the country that allow people to participate in the economy and produce without hindrance. I think that's, that's a fundamental uh, thing that you've got to look at. So what I urge journalists to do is to obviously be journalists that are out there to say, we want this economy to produce, but this policy you come up with doesn't seem to be the right policy for this particular sector. I would love to see that kind of, you know, research and, and, and reporting, other than simply say, well, the Ministry of Mines has come up with this. This is what's going to happen. But what is the impact of that, right? Now, we, we, we enter into the realm of our policy analysis and so on. And one, one last comment. I think that all of you need to be linked uh, to economists at the university, so that you've got questions, you know, you should be able to call the university and say, may I speak to, you know, Dr. N uh, about this issue. Get an explanation and do your writing after you've consulted an expert. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for, for the nice uh, discussion. Unfortunately, because of our time, we won't be able to, to, to have our presenters responding to the questions that we raised. So we are immediately going to lunch. Uh, then after lunch, we are going to have the presenters responding to the questions that we raised. For now, I'm heading over to the uh, Master of Ceremony. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tsarwe. We will have the VIPs leaving the venue first. Um, I think I, I called the names already. Uh, we are only getting the PVC who was not here during um, the, the, the breakfast. So we have um, Professor Msiwa, Professor Mwati, Professor Manyeruke, Dr. Gumbe, Professor Mashiri, PVC, uh, Mr. Msipa, Dr. Kadenge, Mr. Uh, Ms. Makore, Ms. Asali, Mr. Ruinga, Mr. Ruzizo, 
Professor Mabuzongwe, Dr. Nagirai, Mr. Mugaga, Dr. Okonya, Mr. Mchema, Dr. Kanyenze, Mr. Chudu, Mr. Zembe, Mr. Mulea, Mr. Mtasa, Mr. Saruchera, Dr. Mpengegui, Ms. Chikonzo, uh, and Professor Papara. They will have their lunch in G4. Uh, can I have some video for the ladies and gentlemen? Can I, can I have your attention? Can I have your attention? Right, we have 45 minutes. 45 minutes and we, we are back because we are running out of time. So the VIPs can leave first and then the rest uh, will join them. G4, uh, Miss Emerita Mzri will take you to G4 for those who don't know where G4 is and, and this is the VIPs.